Um, and our third talk is by Rich Harrison um, and Ko Yang, who is probably on the um, So, Rich Harrison is presenting on machine learning and microscopy, the search for primary remnants barriers in calcium aluminium inventions. Okay, thanks, Hassan. Yeah, so as I say, this uh, uh, presentation I'm doing on behalf of uh, myself and Ko Yang. Uh, Tung, who's uh, the postdoc working on this and who's uh, away in Taiwan at the minute, maybe online. Uh, so, hello. <coughs> um, the talk is going to be very much in two halves. Um, the work that we're doing is part of what's called the Excite Network, which is a network of uh, labs across Europe. I think 15 different laboratories who are involved in advanced electron and X ray microscopy uh, methods. It provides uh, free access to people uh, to each of those labs around the world, including here in, in uh, Cambridge. So if you're interested in doing advanced TEM uh, or X-ray microscopy, uh, you can go check out the, the website uh, where you, there's a, you can apply to get uh, access to, to the expertise and instrumentation. And as part of this project, we our role in this is to be develop some uh, tools uh, for the analysis of microscopy data and, and uh, the use of machine learning specifically. And what I want to do today is, is sort of introduce that tool very quickly because the applications of it are really great for our kind of work. You know, you know, some of the things that Anna was just talking about, uh, you know, overlap with very much what I'm going to talk about in the second half of this talk. But we're looking at the application of this new uh, method to, to examine the, the minerality of our samples, especially when you have complex uh, mixed mineralogy and, and minerals, the iron oxides, which are very small uh, and overlapping. Uh, and the, the theme is, is again, sort of carrying on this idea of aqueous alteration in carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So I'm going to very quickly uh, introduce you to uh, this, uh, this uh, machine learning tool and then hopefully show you how it can be used. Uh, very nicely as part of a kind of a workflow very typical to, to, to this community's needs so typically when we do an sem data on our, our rocks or in this case uh, the sem image on the on the left here is of a, sort of a synthetic air pollution sample where lots of different types of mineral grains all thrown onto a substrate and overlapping with each other and our job is to is to peer through that haystack and try and find out where the magnetic minerals are where are the iron oxides what kind of iron oxides are there? Are there metals there, uh, etc.? But it's a very complex image. And what we would like to do is to use uh, sort of modern machine learning uh, methods to, to automate the process of analyzing this kind of data, finding out what minerals are there, unmixing them, finding the chemical spectra so that we can identify uh, what's there. So that's the, the kind of the aim of what we're doing. Uh, and so schematically, uh, how we do that, so this sample here is a load of mineral grains dumped onto a substrate they're sort of overlapping with each other we collect in the sem uh, chemical mapping data so we're scanning across our sample uh, collecting elemental maps of the different elements we're interested in iron magnesium silicon oxygen all, all of these things so we have a stack of chemical maps acquired from our from our sample uh, and the idea is to, can we use machine learning to identify clusters of similar behavior? So this obviously is the same thing as here. Okay, so they would cluster together. Uh, the, this is a different cluster uh, to this. Uh, and then once we've identified those clusters, then unmix the different individual uh, mineral phases that correspond uh, to those, those things. So typically, if we're interested in iron oxides, uh, we want to we want to be able to separate out the individual spectra from the from the iron oxides that are in our in our, in our sample and we want to do this automatically you know without having to think about it and this is the sort of task that machine learning is very good uh, so our tool that we've developed as part of this network is called sigma it stands for uh, the spectral interpretation using uh gaussian mixtures and auto encoder handily trips off the tongue uh, sigma for short, and it's based around this, this particular uh, principle here. So uh, we're using what's called a neural network autoencoder. Okay, this is a, a machine learning uh, tool. What it basically does, it takes our, our, our chemical map, our stack of chemical maps, okay, which is a, which is a, a multi-dimensional data. So every pixel in our map 
uh, has, has, has numbers associated with it for the, the chemical uh, compositions of the different elements we're interested in. So this could have a list of 10, 11, 12 elements. So this would be a 12 dimensional uh, data set and you've got thousands of pixels in your image. What the autoencoder does is it designs a neural network that translates all of that multidimensional information into just two dimensions, what is two dimensional latent space. Now, if you're familiar with fork PCA, this is a bit similar, where you take all of your fork diagrams and you boil it down to just a two dimensional PCA score plot, and each point on your score plot represents a, a fork diagram. This does essentially the same thing, but rather than using principal component analysis, this is using a a more sophisticated non-linear uh, mapping based on this, this neural network. So we can encode this data into just two dimensions, uh, which makes it easy to visualize. Uh, and at the same time, you're, you're, you're training a decoder to turn that uh, simple two-dimensional information back into your chemical spectrum. Uh, and the training happens by making sure that the output here is as close as possible uh, to the input here. Uh, and then you extract the useful information from this two-dimensional latent space. Okay, so it's probably easier to illustrate that with uh, an example. So this is what it, this is what it looks like. You feed in your multi-dimensional data, you end up with a two-dimensional uh, latent space, and every pix every dot on here represents a particular pixel uh, in our SEM image with a, a particular chemical signature. And you can see that if you've got different minerals in there, of course, they will generate uh, uh, very specific clusters. So the Gaussian mixture modeling part, this GMM uh, part, then uses uh, uh, fitting this distribution of points uh, to a series of overlapping uh, two-dimensional Gaussian uh, functions. Uh, and on that basis, we can then segment our image. So we can identify different clusters uh, with different colors and uh, therefore uh, segment our image and identify a color with each different chemical cluster. Important thing to realize, however, is that those clusters are not necessarily individual mineral phases because we have, you know, minerals maybe finer grain size than the, than the interaction volume of our SEM image. So, as, as uh, Anna was saying, we're often interested in SD, SD particles. They're smaller than the interaction volume in an SEM EDX map, right? So, that, so none of these cluster uh, maps are going to be pure phases. They're going to be mixtures of phases uh, because there are many multiple phases within your interaction volume. So the next step of this process is to try and identify the individual phases using a, a, a process called uh, non-negative matrix factorization, where we take all the clusters we've identified, and then we use this sort of multivariate statistical uh, approach to break that down into the individual mineral phases and how much of each one we have in there. Okay. So just to uh, illustrate how that looks like in a, in a real example, here's that SEM image from the, from the first slide. This is the latent space, you can see all of these different clusters uh, formed from the chemical mapping, they can be identified with different, uh, different things, background signals, zinc rich, Fe rich, all, all, all these sorts of things. The Gaussian mixture modeling fits all that with Gaussians and allows us then to identify the individual clusters. Uh, and no noting that none of these clusters are pure phases because of the overlapping uh, uh, problem. So you then feed those clusters into the non-negative uh, non matrix factorization part and that breaks down each cluster into a, a, a number of components, which are the pure phases. So for example, this one here, the biggest component that we find here is this one, number three, which when you look here is uh, exactly pure FEO, right? That's, a, that's our magnetite here, okay? And the recovered spectrum is in blue. The actual measured spectrum for pure magnetite is in orange. And, and in this particular case, it works very well. So in, in the sense of trying to find the magnetite within our complex samples, this, this seems to work extremely effectively. So how would you apply this in, 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 in the context of, of magnetism? So I'm going to talk very briefly now about uh, a project that uh, we're currently involved with uh, collaborating with Calais, Bolina and Ben Weiss uh, at MIT. Uh, and it's again, looking, just as we've been hearing from James and Anna, looking for the, the magnetic fields in the solar system. And this project is focusing on calcium aluminium inclusions, which are the very first solids to form in the solar system. And the reason for that is that in theory, at least, if you, if you look at CAIs, uh, you know, they can potentially push our knowledge of the solar system back to uh, very early times because they're the first solids to have formed. They may well have been processed thermally later, and that's uh, that's a question that needs needs answering. But in principle, at least, CAIs uh, are time zero. 
in the solar system. So looking at the magnetic signals they might carry uh, could push us back in time. Uh, CAIs are also thought to have formed very close to the sun. And these are these curves that James showed in his talk. And uh, again, if you're looking at CAIs, they may have formed closer into the sun and pushing you there, okay? What happens subsequently to them is, a, is, a, is another question. Uh, but in theory, at least, that's the, the motivation for looking at CAIs is to push our knowledge back in time and space. Um, the, the meteorite we're looking at is, is a CO, a carbonaceous chondrite. Again, Anna mentioned that these are, these are relatively unaltered. This is a CO 3.00 meteorite. That means it's the least thermally altered and the least aqueously altered uh, a variety of, of carbonaceous chondrite. It's this particular one here, Dominion range 08006. Uh, and so if you're going to go for a meteorite and trying to find pristine uh, materials from the early solar system, this is a good place to start. And we're looking at these calcium aluminium rich inclusions. This is from a, a paper a number of years ago now showing that the, there are some really beautiful CAIs within this uh, meteorite, which preserve these, these condensation sequences of, of calcium aluminium rich materials. And then they're sort of mantled here by a more uh, forced right uh, material. Okay. So uh, the workflow, we're trying to track down the, the magnetic uh, signals within these CAIs. So we've been working on two particular CAIs uh, from this meteorite that carry magnetic signals. Uh, this is the first one we've looked at. Uh, what you're showing here is the outline of the grain, the, the sort of fine red features are the, the iron chemical map, and the broad red features here are the, are the QDM signals. Now this is an SIRM, this is a saturation magnetization. So we magnetize the CAI to get the most magnetic signal out of it. And what you can see there is that there's a very good correlation between the presence of iron within the CAI and uh, the magnetic signal that's produced. Uh, but there are some also regions here which are apparently free of iron, but do have strong magnetic signals. So, so there's two different uh, regions. We're going to focus in on these very iron rich regions of the CAI here uh, to try and answer the question, why are they so iron rich? What, what on earth is going on in those, in those regions and what's carrying that magnetic signal? So using this Sigma workflow, we would take a chemical map across the entire of that grain. So measuring all the elements uh, of interest, including, uh, including iron. And then we can feed that through uh, our Sigma uh, uh, machine learning tool to get a kind of a breakdown of the mineralogy. So we're focusing here on the, this corner here, which was very much strongly magnetic and very iron rich. This is a zoom in and the, the sort of Sigma map and superimposing that on top we get this mineralogical breakdown of what's going on inside uh, this region. And we can see that the, the, the region that's iron rich is also mineralogically quite distinct from, from the rest. So the red here is the main CAI phase, which is galenite. Uh, there's regions of spinel, uh, which is uh, green and perovskite, which is in yellow. Uh, there's this mineral ackermanite, which is in blue. And then there's this brown stuff in, in the middle, which is essentially a very rich in iron oxide, but not pure iron oxide. So the information you get from the, from, the, from the machine learning is you get that map of where that iron oxide signal is coming from. Uh, you get the chemical signature of that. You can see there's a mixture of elements here. And then using this non-negative matrix factorization, you can see what are the dominant chemical components within that, those iron rich regions. So it's component two and four here. One is a magnesium silicate sort of component and the other is this uh, pure iron oxide uh, phase. So we can know that that region is, contains uh, something like uh, magnetite, but it's mixed in with some other sort of uh, silicate phase. So what we've done is to ground truth that. So we can now go in and using this mineralogical map as a guide, we can select areas of interest then to do TN, uh, extract those information. So from that region there, which goes across uh, a region of, um, from the CAI region over here, this image is flipped with respect to this one. So this is the, the red region, the CA, calcium aluminium rich phases. This is the brown region, which is a complete mess, okay? And you can see it's texturally very, very complicated. It's got a whole mixture of phases in there, but, but uh, and then we, what we can do is then use um, Sigma to uh, find out what's going on in, in more detail. So at the TM level now, we do the same thing. We take chemical maps of that entire section. Uh, we feed that through uh, Sigma and we can now get a much more detailed breakdown of the mineral, minerals that are going on in there. How long was that? One, One minute. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, 
I'll fire you later. Uh, okay. okay. So uh, right. So what you see on the, the top left is the uh, is this this two dimensional later space. All the, all the chemical clusters here. This is the iron oxide. And this is now, you can see that it's essentially pure iron oxide and you get a very detailed map now of where that iron oxide is. You can see it's all mixed together with these iron magnesium silicates. You can find the carbonates here, you can find relic olivine here, which is being altered. And then you've got all of your CAI mineral phases there. Okay, so I haven't got going to go into the details of all this, obviously, because Hassan will kill me. Um, but uh, you can see that we can pull out all of the different mineralogical phases. What we're seeing here essentially is, is something akin to, to, to serpentinization, producing huge amounts of magnetite, new magnetite growing uh, within these, uh, these altered regions. Okay, uh, I won't go into, into this particular CI uh, in any detail, but we can we do the same thing. This is a different uh, inclusion. We get a full mineralogical map. We can then identify regions of interest, which we can then go in with the TEN uh, and identify things. And the only reason for showing this one at the end is that, is that actually this is what we came uh, to this meteorite to find, which was little evidence that there were maybe primary metallic iron within the CAI itself. Uh, and these are, these are uh, examples of, of sub-micron, few hundred nanometer size iron metal blobs sitting beautifully within the CAI away from any kind of alteration. So those, those regions do exist um, within the sample. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll skip just to the conclusions then. So yeah, so hopefully what I've given you a flavor of is that there's this new tool out there that we can use as part of our workflow for characterizing uh, the phases that we're interested in and it's particularly good at hunting down where the iron oxides within our sort of complex mineralogy. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be uh, enormously useful for the sorts of work that we've been hearing about actually already this morning. Okay, thanks. Questions? Suggestions? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just I can't see who else is asking, so please feel free to ignore me if I'm not. <laughs> well, well, James was first. And then, yeah. So, what does that all mean for the protocol? Yeah, good question. So, I think it's a very similar story to what you were talking about, James, right? So, we found evidence that there, there is primary metal within the CAI that could. Uh, we need to track, we need to demonstrate it further that, 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 that those metal, the, the, the pristine primary metal is responsible for the QDM signals they're seeing that, that are away from the iron, right? If that's true, if there is potentially primary paleomagnetic signal in there carried by that metal. You've then got all of this additional magnetite that's forming uh, in some regions. Um, now, if that magnetite is forming in the absence of a field, then you have the same problem that you highlighted. You would be underestimating the paleo intensity massively if you magnetize that magnetite in the laboratory, but it's not magnetized in nature. So that, so, so I think Cowie is finding what 150 microteslas, something like that, for these CAIs. That could be a massive underestimate. Uh, but it all rests on whether we can prove that the primary, some of those QDM signals are, are actually associated with the primary metal and not just altered regions which are underneath the sample uh, that they're not visible at the surface. So yeah, that would be the, the main conclusion. I think that's on there for some <laughs> uh, Yeah, wait, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah, so a really silly question probably and, and probably uh, doesn't make much sense, but I was wondering uh, you know, the magnetite you showed was either surrounded by some calcite or by the ackermanite, which is also a calcite-rich uh, mineral. I just wondered how magnetite would form in such a cir circumstance or whether you would have expected magnetite actually to have come originally from uh, pure iron um, parent material. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so I think we need to work out how much iron is flushed in from the matrix how much iron is in, say, the olivine phases around, around these things. I mean, the textures, this looks like serpentinization to me. I mean, the, the, right. in, 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 in one CAI, this complex texture we're seeing is, is, is texturally quite distinct. And we're seeing things that look like serpentinization. See this relic olivine that's being altered 
here and growing new magnetite and it's all a complete mess and there's these large blobs of, of, of iron oxide in here as well. Um, the other sample, the magnetite is sort of bits of matrix which are being flushed in along cracks is what we're seeing. That's a very different mechanism. But mm -hmm. where, what the source of the iron is, I mean, some of it, you know, I don't know how much iron is in the olivine, the, the primary olivine around these CAIs. Okay. Um, if you go back to here, you can see that the, there is olivine, right? Forsterite around mm -hmm. these things. And the, you know, there's bits that get embayed like this. Now, if they, if they altered and, and produced uh, magnetite, as you do see in serpentinization reactions, then that would explain the sort of textures we get. But how much, all of, how much iron is actually in here to begin with? Perhaps not very much. Um, so some of that iron could be sourced from the matrix. Uh, you know, the, 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 the metal that's being altered in the matrix, the, there's altered. There's, there is, although the CO 3.0 is supposedly minimally altered, it's, it's not zero alteration. There is some alteration in there. We can see that also in, in this analysis. So I think most of it must be sourced from, from the matrix coming in uh, and then yeah. that, that needs, needs uh, some further work. So one quick follow-up question, if I have, if this time, uh, the AI tool looks amazing, but how much do you have to constrain that to the particular sample and the mineralogy that you expect in that sample? So it's all self-trained, right? So there's no, there's no, it's using the autoencoder. The the classification part is all done based on the data you collect. There's no training required based on other types of samples. So it can be applied to any sample. It's so that, that's the auto encoder part. It, it trains the neural network based on what it sees in your specific sample. And then the Gaussian part just identifies those clusters. The, the bit where you come in as the scientist is, is interpreting those clusters, what they mean, what the spectra are and that kind of thing and, and, uh, and which clusters are related and which are just sort of overlapping and that kind of thing. So it is a useful tool to aid you as, a, as someone trying to interpret what you're seeing. But it doesn't require any external training. It's all done based on what the data you collect for that specific image. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.